In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Be seated, please. I had a wonderful cousin who lived in Perth Amboy. She's much older than I was, than I am. Uh, in fact, she was the cousin who, as a young woman, took me to Newark, to the movies, on a train. How could you not think that she's your favorite cousin? So I grew up always, you know, caring about and respecting this particular cousin. She was a wonderful woman. But when I was first ordained uh, and was serving in the parish church as curate in the church in New Brunswick, I went over to Perth Amboy and visited with my cousin, and she told me this story. She had had three children. She was chronically overweight. She had high blood pressure and a very uh, dicky heart, you know, it just wasn't, wasn't right. And the doctor said to her after her third child, which had always had an issue, a, a you know, problem when she had gave birth, but the doctor said to her, you cannot have any more children because your life is in danger. You need to practice birth control. Well, my cousin was a devout Roman Catholic, but she and her husband, so was her husband, but they did begin to practice birth control. And she told me, as I say, this story uh, when I was visiting as a young curate. She said she, of course, being the kind of Roman Catholic she was, she went to confession and told Monsignor that she had, this was what they were doing. He said, well, you can't receive communion as long as you're doing that. And so she had been, by the time I was talking to her, maybe 10, 15 years without receiving the Blessed Sacrament. And it hurt her, it bothered her. Uh, she still went to Mass every Sunday, she still was devout, and followed all the, you know, as she, best she could, all the rules of the Church, but one, which she could not, uh, because her life depended on it. And in the end, you know, she, uh, she, she just was, was bothered by this, as you might be. Well, at that time, I was, uh, before I was married, of course, I had uh, shared my house with a young Roman Catholic priest friend who was, um, uh, lived in, in, one of the, in the spare room and who was assisting the college, the Roman Catholic chaplain at Rutgers University. And so I asked him, is this, this is actually the regulation in the Roman church? And he said, oh yeah, he says, but, he says, but tell your cousin to use her conscience. Does she really think that she's doing, a, 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 you know, a, a sinning against God? He says, use her conscience when she, so, and, and not to worry about what Monsignor has to say. And I told her that, and she basically said, well, Monsignor did this, he's going to have to undo it. And she refused to budge. And she remained excommunicate from the church for another 10 years, perhaps, until her mother died. And just before her mother's death, she, she went to confession to Monsignor. By that time, you see, she was beyond childbearing years. And so, yes, she was admitted to Holy Communion and was happy again, at least to the end of her days. I mentioned, you know, I, I, now I'm sure part of it was her own stubbornness. You know, I'm, Monsignor did this, he's going to have to undo it. I'm sure part of it was that. But the other part of it was she was a classic example of the kind of religiosity that views laws and commandments as a whole checklist of things that you absolutely must do and must follow blindly, regardless of what confronts you in your life. You must follow, if it said, if this is what is said, then this is what I must do. And I'm not suggesting that this is only a problem for Roman Catholics. This kind of attitude of legalism of looking at the law as, as, as sort of a, as something that we must follow absolutely um, regardless of what reality presents to us. This kind of legalism exists all across the spectrum of, of the Christian movement. Uh, the people will find things that they want to say, this is an absolute sh assurance, we must follow it, must do this. No matter what happens, we have to be, abide by these set of laws, whether it's the you know, the teachings of the church or the commandments or the prayer book or the Bible. People will, organ, you know, say that th this is absolutely must be followed. And it's not just something that Christians are only prone. I mean, most, most religious communities have groups of people who are 
so, well, fundamentally bound to following every jot and tittle of the law in a very straightforward way, you find it all across the spectrum of, of religiosity in all faiths. Jesus certainly found it in the community that he uh, lived in, that he grew up in. And I think it's what Jesus was speaking about. It's what Jesus was speaking about particularly as he, uh, we hear him today in the gospel appointed for this particular Sunday. Jesus thought, you know, you have heard it said that you shall not murder. Okay, straightforward law. But what I say to you is that if you are angry with your brother, if you, you know, are, are dismissive or hurtful of your sister, if you uh, aren't recognizing the need for, to, to respect them, it's in the same category, in a sense, of murder. Oh, you haven't taken a life, at least not in the standard way of letting, you know, killing someone. But in many ways, when you hurt, when you're angry, when you're dismissive of people, it hurts, it kills. The law, in other words, the law as stated, simply enough, we could all say, well, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm going to guess that most of us in this church can say we have never taken a human life. But how often have we disrespected, disregarded, murdered in another way human life by belittling, by taking, not taking seriously. The commandment runs deeper than what the actual word of the commandment says, is what Jesus, I think, was telling us in all of the gospel that we heard today as he, he sort of opens up to us that there's more here than just surface understanding. And commandments are not just about sort of um, um, List, reading what's there and, 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 and organizing your life around just doing that and saying, well, now I've done it, aren't I good? It's always deeper. In fact, I just, I, you know, when he goes on to say that if you're bringing your gift to the altar and you're there, remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. I can't help but uh, go back to a time when uh, I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Antigua in the Caribbean and through us, most of that time, most of the clergy were English clergy, but they had just ordained a, a young priest, a West Indian guy, and one of his early sermons I shall never forget because it was precisely on this text. And Father Richardson tried to sort of make the point in the sense that I'm making, that people can read the text, you know, they can hear the law, you shall not murder, but if you're bringing your gift to the altar, and he was straight, I got my first blast of West Indian genuine West Indian preaching. And he said, standing in the pulpit, said, you know, I know that some of you in this church have come to church angry and fighting with your brother. And some of you have come to church to have and said nasty things about your sister. So how dare you come to God's table and receive the blessed sacrament when you're filled with hate. Go out and say you're sorry. And I swear he cut the number of communicants by about half that Sunday. Because I said this, I like, there's no nonsense, no nonsense preaching. But, oh, but what is the law for then? If it's not just to be taken literally and just as a way of, as a, as a, as a you know, something that we should, a checklist for my life. If I'm, well, I haven't murdered, I haven't committed adultery, I haven't done this. Ooh, I'm not sure about that one, but mm, we'll think about it. You know, it's, I, don't, I think the law is more than that. When Moses says to the people of God, you know, I offer you two choices here, life and death. He's talking about the law, the law that God gave on Sinai to Moses and came to the people of God. But what is the purpose of that law? Primarily, it's not a checklist to which, around which to just simply organize your life and, and tick it off and say, well, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, and, and, and then give yourself a, an A plus or a B minus, whatever it might be. What it actually, I think, is, is doing is providing a way for us, human beings, to relate to our God. It's giving us a vehicle 
by which we can live in the presence of God. And when he offers us the choice of life and of death, it's the choice of living with God in our life, walking with God, allowing him to lead us, allowing him to walk with us in, in, uh, in our journey, on the one hand, or rejecting that. It's not just about a checklist of, of do's and don'ts, of rights and wrongs. It's a way of living in the presence of God, and that is the very essence of the law. And when Jesus tries to show us that there's more to it than just what it reads on the page, that it, goes, it runs deeper into our lives, I think this is what he's trying to open our, our hearts and minds to, that living according to the law is basically to live in the presence of God. And I think that that's actually good news. While it might be easier, and they always said, oh, it's easier, you know, uh, the churches and, and, that, and, and, and religious groups that provide absolute certainty to people, you do this and it's good, you do that and it's no good, uh, you do this and you're going to heaven, you do that and you're going to hell. When people have that kind of certainty, it's probably very comforting. But it's also not honoring the full humanity of any of us. Because our lives are more complicated. Our lives are more nuanced. We, we, we find ourselves in places that the law, in its written form, never anticipates sometimes. And as my priest friend said, you got to use your conscience. You got to use the conscience, your God-given conscience, when you're living with God in a relationship you see, it's not as if you're having to do that on your own. And that is the good news. It might be simpler or seem simpler to have everything spelled out for you as to exactly what you should do. But any realistic person knows that that's not the way life goes. Our lives are more complex, more nuanced, more complicated, uh, more difficult. But what God provides for us in the law is just a way of living in his presence cultivating that relationship, walking with him in his ways. Uh, it's not that the law says anything that's wrong. Jesus said, you know, not one jot or, or letter of the, of the law will ever disappear. But, if we, but it's not to be taken as something to replace, in a sense, God himself. The real purpose of the law is for us to live in his presence, to walk with him at our side, to have, allow him to be part of our agonies, our anguish, our, 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 our confusions, and things that come to us in the midst of ordinary life. And he is there. And that's the hope, and that's the promise. And I would say if there's any takeaway from this morning, I would hope that that's it, that our God is always with us, wanting to be with us. We don't have to rely on, on just, you know, if we've done the right thing or the wrong thing. Our God is always with us. And he'll see us through in all of our lives' complexities. That is what it seems to me would to be live in the liberty of our faith is all about. To live in the presence of God, because that is life itself. The God whom we see in the face of Jesus, that God of love. And he calls us to walk with him, or the other way around, allow us, allow him to walk with us in our journeys and to be there. Oh, the law, it's there as a kind of guideline. It's kind of, kind of like, I, I compared it earlier today about GPS. It's kind of like that. It can show you how to get from A to B. It can even nowadays show you some of the problems you might have along the way. But ultimately, it's gonna still be up to us all along the way to face those things that we didn't anticipate, that couldn't be, we couldn't be warned about, that we couldn't have foreseen because life is complex, but our God is with us. And when we love and obey, we try to stay, what that means is to stay close to him in all that we do and say. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.